Welcome to another episode of Get Started Investing, a podcast where we answer all of your money and investing questions. If you've just joined us, we do recommend that you scroll up and start at episode one where you'll find 12 episodes to get you confident and investing in the stock market. However, there's also nothing wrong with jumping in with with us today. My name is Bryce and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this episode. We are going under the hood. Yes. This was a series that we launched last year. Um, ETFs have exploded in popularity uh, over the past, call it two years, three years. and there are so many out there now a really common question we get and a question that we have ourselves is how do we go about analyzing Mm. these etfs and you often hear from experts you have to look under the hood Mm. and we wanted to know what that meant and so we launched this series to try and understand how to analyze etfs as well as actually going under the hood of some of the more popular etfs out there that's it today we are going under the hood of JP Morgan's Global Bond Active ETF. We know income is a really big focus for a lot of people at the moment. Uh, So we're having a look at that. And it's not just us doing it. We have got an expert all the way from the UK uh, who actually uh, runs this fund as part of his job as head of global aggregate bonds at JP Morgan Asset Management. This is the biggest person that we've dragged under a hood with us. <laughs> yes. uh, we're speaking to Miles Bradshaw. Yes, uh, we've brought in the uh, the big guys to help us through this. So a big thank you to Miles for uh, taking the time uh, for the Get Started Investing community. So just uh, to give context on what we cover in all of these episodes, we look at the purpose of the ETF and what it seeks to do, the index that it, tr- it tracks or how it's constructed, fees, performance, top holdings, and then more importantly, where it fits or how it can fit in your portfolio. Not all of these ETFs are going to form your core portfolio. Not all of them are going to go in your thematic. It's just uh, important that you understand where they fit and how they can play a part in your portfolio if they're right for you. And I guess over time, what we hope to do with this Under the Hood series is have a library of Mm. uh, episodes that relate to different ETFs. So when people are thinking about investing in them, they can go back and find out some of those key characteristics. After you've listened to this episode, if you do want to find out more information about this particular ETF, the best place to start is the website. The issuer's website is always... um, the best place to start. So this one, the JP Morgan Asset Management website, looking at the Global Bond Active ETF, we'll include that link in the show notes. Yeah, this is the first of a few episodes that we'll be doing with JP Morgan and the active ETFs that they have uh, listed over the past couple of years. A big thank you to JP for supporting this series. But without further ado, let's jump into it. Well, Miles, welcome to Get Started Investing. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So, can you introduce us to uh, the JP Morgan Global Bond Acti- Active ETF yeah. and more specifically what it seeks to do? Yeah. So we launched this uh, late last year, JP Morgan Global Bond, JPGB. We launched it late last year. It's listed in Australia and it's a diversified global bond fund. And its objective is to outperform the broadest global bond market there is in the world, which is the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index. And it's all hedged back into Australian dollar. The investment is in a diversified range of bond securities. There's government bonds, there's government related bonds, there's corporate credit, which is companies issuing bonds, there's high yield bonds, there's emerging market bonds, and also there's mortgage bonds and other securitized uh, transactions in there. And you might ask, why should I invest in a bond fund? You know, the bond fund, I think plays a big role in portfolios. There's three key elements I think you want to invest in a bond fund. One, you want stable income. Two, you want capital preservation. And three, most importantly, particularly if you're a a young person, you want something that can diversify your equities. And a bond fund, if you combine it with an equity portfolio, what it does is enables you to have a higher return, but without having the volatility that you get from the equity market. So it diversifies your portfolio. And if you think about that, what that means is you can actually take more risk in your equity portfolio without actually having a more risky portfolio than a pure equity portfolio only. So I think one thing um, to clarify with this fund, it's an active ATF um, rather than an index ATF. Uh, so can you just explain what that distinction is and, and how that works yeah. for JPGB? Yeah, so an index ETF basically just replicates 
the benchmark. There are, like in any benchmark, there are thousands of security. So they don't own every single security, but they replicate it so they've got the very similar risk profile. With an active ETF, what we're trying to do is actually deliver a higher return than the benchmark. And so where securities are expensive, we tend to not own them. And when securities are cheap, we own more of them. And clearly what happens, particularly in fixed income, is prices and valuations change over the economic cycle. If we're looking at an environment of rate cuts, you want to own more interest rate risk. Uh, if you're looking at an environment of rate hikes, as we were a couple of years ago, you want to own less interest rate risk. And so by adjusting those risks in the portfolio, we have been able to deliver better returns to our investors, which obviously compound up over time to give a substantially higher return in your portfolio. There's a key difference, I think, about active investing in fixed income than equities. In equities, you know, good companies, they have a bigger earnings, their market cap goes up, you own more of a good company, that's what the index does. In fixed income, the index is actually weighted to the biggest debtors. So the more debt a company has, the more you end up owning if you're just simply replicating the benchmark. Now, that may or may not be a good thing, but what's clear is that you're not buying more of a better company. You're just buying more of a big debtor. Mm. The other thing is um, economic policymakers use the fixed income markets to achieve certain economic outcomes. We saw that over the last 15 years with quantitative easing. That was central banks intervening in bond markets in Australia actually setting the yield on the bond, not because it was a good investment but because they wanted to achieve a certain investment outcome. So as an investor, you shouldn't necessarily be following what the policymaker is doing. You need to be actually making an investment judgment. And so that's an important distinction. It can more easily be distorted by policymakers that are trying to achieve policy outcomes. And the third is that in fixed income, there's a wide variety of strategies. And some are correlated with certain risk factors like equities. Others are correlated with the opposite. And by being active, you can build portfolios where you can get strategies that are negatively correlated. And so you can add returns into your portfolio without simply adding risk or volatility to that, that portfolio. Mm. And that's in addition to be able to take active views about where we are in the interest rate cycle or the economic cycle. Mm. So that's a, a good point. Are there any um, particular portfolio construction rules that this, uh, you know, that the fund is Built yep. around? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a core global bond fund. Um, so the index we are aiming to beat is an investment grade index. We can buy high yield, but to reflect the philosophy and nature of the fund, we're only allowed to buy up to 10% in high yield. The fund is hedged into Australian dollars, uh, but we can take active FX tilts. So there will be some element of FX risk, but overwhelmingly, you know, between 80 to 90, even 100% of the portfolio will be hedged into Australian dollars. And so just to jump in there, Miles, for, you know, a lot of the get started investing community who are, you know, starting their journey with ETFs, you often get a choice with some of them between hedged and unhedged, or, you know, it won't often say unhedged, but mm. it will make it clear that it's hedged. What exactly is that? Yeah, so the difference is if I'm buying a load of foreign assets, Obviously, the Australian dollar could depreciate, uh, and that would cause the value of those, of those foreign assets to go up in, in Aussie dollar terms. Now, hedging it means that you're taking away that FX risk. So the return you're getting isn't due to the volatility in the Australian dollar, but it's actually due to the investment return of the underlying asset. And that's, that's really important because currencies are extremely volatile. So if you're buying a bond fund that's unhedged, most of your return and most of the volatility of returns is going to come from the, whether the Aussie dollar is going up or down 5%. And that's not really what you want to be doing with a fixed income fund. You want to be getting the return from the underlying asset class. Mm. Um, so that, that's an important distinction uh, if you want to be looking at, at returns. Mm. 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 Now, um, you mentioned some portfolio construction rules before. Uh, because it is an active ETF, how, I guess, how does it, the portfolio change over time? What's the process um, to, to Yeah, change? I mean, clearly, you know, to be able to invest in global fixed income, you've got to have a strong team. We're investing in uh, Chinese bonds. There's some Chinese bonds in the portfolio. We're investing in U.S. commercial real estate. 
Uh, we're investing in European banks, clearly in a very diversified manner. This is, these aren't big bets we're making on single properties in the US. And so we rely on our team. We have 300 investors globally across five countries. Uh, we break down by different asset classes. So every single security we invest in, we're doing f fundamental research to making sure that we can get our money back and this is good value security. So that's the first most important thing is actually having a process that enables you to identify value wherever it is in the global bond market. Um, the portfolio construction is really about thinking about the risk profile of the portfolio. What we want to be doing is delivering consistent steady returns. We've had a strategy in Europe since 2009 on a rolling three-year basis, we have always outperformed the market. And when we look at our returns over a longer-term horizon, we've consistently outperformed the market with the same risk profile as the benchmark. And so uh, risk control is a really important part of any fixed income portfolio to make sure that um, you're getting the income, getting as much income as possible, but your principal is protected. It's good quality credit. Under the Hood is all about exploring specific ETFs and helping us analyze. And one of the big things we always look at is fees. So can you talk us through uh, the fees of the ETF and uh, yeah, help us understand that? Yeah, so the fee on this product is 0.45%. Um, and that's, that's the standard fee. Um, you have to compare that to the yield on the product, which is about in the order of 5%. You can look precisely on, on um, on our website to get the precise yield because obviously it depends on, on the market profile. Mm. Um, so that's those are the numbers. Yeah, mm. nice. Well, that was going to be my next question, uh, the historic performance. And whilst this is a relatively new product in Australia, uh, it does have a longer track record overseas. Yeah. So the, the performance clearly tracks the bond market. You know, if bond prices are going down, then it's likely that we'll be going down but by less. And if bond prices are going up, we'll be going up by less. But when we look at the returns that our, our longest standing strategy has had, we have consistently outperformed the market by about 1% per annum since inception. Um, and so obviously this compounds up over time to be a, a, better, a better return. Um, so the returns have been very good. We're a core fund, so we're not gonna do stupid things when there isn't a great deal of value in the market. We're not gonna be trying to, when there is no yield on offer, reaching for yield and then finding actually things change and we have a big drawdown in capital. So performance and excess returns are likely to be higher when there is value in the market and when there's volatility in the market as we had in 2021 and 22. And when there's less volatility as we had in 2014 and 15, then returns will be, will be more modest. But we have consistently outperformed even in those type of years. The fixed income market is difficult for retail investors to get access to outside of products like this. Can you talk to some of the top holdings in the fund? Because when it comes to these ETFs, looking at the top mm. holdings versus looking at the top holdings of say S&P 500 can be quite confusing. Yes, and, and this think this is an important <laughs> well, point. So, sorry, just before, yeah. before you do, I think just to illustrate uh, that challenge, because I'm on the, the website now, we've got the, JP Morgan USD liquidity LV NAV, mm. uh, United States 4.5%, Kingdom of no idea, 3.5%, yes. Peoples 2.8%. Yes, so go. for the retail investor looking at this, uh, it's not it, meaningful. it is no. confusing. Yes. So help us understand it. So I actually looked at our top 10 holdings <laughs> because, uh, and you know, it, it's not meaningful. The biggest position is a 3% position in a US Treasury bond. The next biggest is another government bond. And all that reflects is that fixed income portfolios are diversified portfolios. Um, clearly, we're willing to take more single issuer risk in a government bond than in a credit bond. Um, and so that's why you'll find that typically the top 10 holdings are likely to be government bonds because they're liquid, they're easily to transact, and you want to have liquid assets. So for a fixed income portfolio, the better way to look at this is to look at things like what is the yield on the portfolio? That tells you, broadly speaking, what's the income you're going to get. The second is what's the credit quality of the portfolio? We have, and apologies for the jargon, we have a letter jargon to talk about credit quality. If something is AAA, it's the best credit quality. You then go down to AA plus, AA, AA minus, 
single A plus, single A, single A minus, triple Bs. <laughs> what we call high yield is double B. Now to put that in context, the cumulative default in double A's over five years is rounded down, it's less than you know, 0.1%. So default risk is only really escalated when you get down to sort of the double B and single B category. So these are quite safe assets and the risk you're really running is that they may be downgraded, but they're, they're not assets where you expect to be losing your capital and therefore you want a very high in income for that. If we're comparing active bond funds, mm -hmm. uh, you make that information clear on your website, the level of credit risk within the portfolio? It should be. You should yeah. be able to see, if you delve into the key features, you should be able to see the, the rating so, so let and me, compare that to the rating of the index. So uh, on the JP Morgan Asset Management website, if you go to portfolio, they've got sector breakdown, regional breakdown, top 10 holdings, but bond quality breakdown is the tab that you want to go to. 36% AAA, 17% AA, uh, only 2% in B or below. So, yes. Yeah. And so... Clearly, if you've got a fund that's got lots of double B or high yield, the yield should be higher, but you've obviously got a more risky portfolio. Risk, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's very important. And the, the third thing is, as you say, that geographical breakdown. You know, is your exposure there in the US and US interest rate risk? Is the exposure in Europe or is it in Japan? The most important part of a bond fund is, and apologies for the jargon, is something we called duration. It's a number that represents the level of interest rate risk in the portfolio. Uh, and to give you the quick maths on this, if there is a duration of five years, broadly speaking, it means that a 1% move in interest rates will result in a 5% change in price. So more risky funds have longer durations. Clearly, if you've got a 30-year bond fund, you'll have a duration actually of around 20 years. And so a 1% move in interest rates can actually be really material for your capital. Now that is good and bad because clearly if the equity market falls 10%, you could be looking at 10% gain in your bond fund. So it does diversify your equity risk more, but it is a more risky fund. Um, the interest rate risk on our portfolio is in the order of six years, which means broadly speaking, a 1% move in interest rates would be a 6% change in price. Um, it's diversified globally, so we're not just talking about Australian bonds or US bonds. Uh, there's a diversified aspect, which means that all the yields don't move up and down together. But that is that is that's the that and credit rating give you the clue as to how risky or how volatile this fund may be. Um, and obviously, risk can be good. You know, you do get higher returns, but there's going to be more volatility in price. Mm. Mm. So we've covered the fees, uh, the performance, uh, some of the top holdings. And I guess, uh, you know, at the start we spoke about, I guess, the purpose of the ETF and how it seeks to achieve that purpose. I think really the final aspect is about how it actually fits into a, an investor's portfolio. Yep. Now, um, you're uh, out in Australia doing a road show and speaking to some of Australia's biggest institutions, uh, and you're also speaking to some of the smallest investors mm. in Bryce and I, so you've covered the full range. So I guess more for investors like Bryce and I, uh, retail investors with smaller dollar amounts, how does this fund fit in our yep. portfolios? So I think the first thing is, you know, what does a, an ETF give you, a fixed in income ETF? You can put your money in cash and you can get return. I'm being told you, you can get up to 5% from some banks if you, if you pay in or, or spend a certain amount of money and this kind of stuff. Mm. If you want to diversify your portfolio and have an asset that goes up in price when interest rates go down, you need to be buying bonds, not putting your money in cash. Because obviously your cash rate will go down uh, and you'll get a lower income from that cash rate. So that's why you want to be buying bonds. The second thing is, if you you don't have much money, you can't get that global diversification. You don't want to put all your money and lend it to a one company through a direct lending scheme, and that company goes bust and you have nothing. You want to diversify. And that's what the bond fund can do. In our portfolio, you know, we have hundreds of securities. So your $10 or your $100 is diversified instantly and you're not running so much risk that events have to go perfectly for you to get your income and your money back. So that's the main reason why 
uh, investors, particularly retail investors, would want to buy a bond fund is to get that diversification that they can't replicate themselves. And the third thing is, why would you want to buy an ETF? And the reason to buy an ETF is because of the ease and transparency. It's very convenient. My portfolio is stacked full of ETFs. I can go online and I can see the price of that portfolio at this moment, not what it was yesterday. You know, after the events have taken place, I can see the price at this moment. If I want to sell it, I can sell it now. I can't put an order in and I wait two or three days to find the price I sold it at. Mm. So it's that portfolio convenience that you can rebalance your portfolio uh, on the go whenever you want to, I think that is the beauty of ETFs and that they're gaining in popularity everywhere. Um, and they will increasingly become, I think, the way that people think about their portfolio construction. Just one question on that is, should should these bond ETFs be considered as like bottom draw, uh, put away and, and last forever, like along with those real core port, uh, you know, ETFs? Um, or how should we think about that in relation to those? Yeah, I mean, I always think that when you're investing, and it depends on where you are in the life cycle investment, but as a young person investing, you, you can take more risk. You, you should be investing with the idea of building capital, whether it's for a, a certain big purchase, whether it be a house or ultimately for retirement, or even perhaps you want to go on a fancy holiday or what have you. But when you're accumulating capital, you should be willing to take more risk. And so you should be thinking about core building blocks, whether it's fixed income, whether it's equities, that present the bulk of that investment in a diversified manner. And what you'll want to be doing is if there's a very good run in the equity market and it's going really well and everyone thinks you know it's ever forever going up, you, that's probably the time you want to reallocate away from it when you want to be able to tactically move your risk up and down depending on where we are in the cycle. And that's where you will go tilt a bit between your building blocks. And it makes it very easy if you've got a couple of building blocks rather than thousands of single line securities to do that tilt depending on whether there's a lot of euphoria and stock prices are very high or there's a lot of pessimism and stock prices are very low. And the third thing is as you reach your goals, if you're looking to buy a house, you don't want to be taking so much risk because you'll want that capital to go and buy a house. And that's where you'll want to reduce your risky investment in equities and increase your, fit, your safe investments in fixed income so that you know that principle is going to be protected for that major purchase, uh, whether it be a house or the holiday, or indeed eventually touch wood, you know, if we are ever able to retire, you know, <laughs> the retirement. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Well, um, Miles, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, fixed income is an important sleeve within a diversified portfolio. As you said, it preserves capital, provides income and diversification. And the JP Morgan Global Bond Active ETF, ticker JPGB, invests in a global portfolio of higher rating bonds, providing investors with global diversification and managing volatility. And Ren, we'll put the link to the website and all of the resources that we spoke about today in the show notes if you want to have a look in more detail. But uh, Miles, thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Thanks, Miles. Really enjoyed that. Thank you.